but politically that, that word did not make any sense to me. Um, but I was really afraid to, to voice my opinion. There was no war at the time. I'm talking still, uh, by the time we got deployed, this was at the beginning of March of 2003. And I didn't want to be that single voice saying, you know, I'm against this thing. You know, I didn't want to be called a traitor or a coward or unpatriotic or anything like that. And I was in a leadership position. I was a, an infantry squad leader. I was a staff sergeant, or I was a, a sergeant promotable to be promoted in Iraq. And um, I was really afraid. I was really afraid of standing up and saying, I think this is wrong. There was no war at the time. And, and part of me hoped that in the end, we would just have like this huge show of force to scare Saddam Hussein out of power. And that if we did invade, that it would be a quick invasion and we would be back pretty soon, and that Iraqis would be in charge of their country. I was very naive. Um, but we got deployed. Uh, we served in Jordan at first, and then we moved to Iraq at the end of April of 2003. And this is where my, my transformation really begins, from being just politically opposed to the war to being like more personally and more spiritually opposed to, to, to the war. Because the first mission that we had was at this place called Al-Assad, which was a, an old Iraqi Air Force base. And some of the, the, the jet bunkers that they had have been improvised into uh, prisoner of, of war camps or detention camps. And when we got there, the people in charge <coughs> were, were um, spooks. There were people who were basically untraceable. Uh, they don't wear name tags or unit ID patches or anything like that. They don't go by their real, real names. They don't wear uniforms. But they're highly trained and they have top se secret clearance. And these people are like experts on weapon systems interrogations, uh, linguistics, and things of that nature. And our job there was basically to soften up prisoners so that the spooks could basically interrogate them. And the way we did that was by keeping them sleep deprived. So we got there and we found these this, this detainees. Some of them have been detained because they were in possession of a weapon. And at this time, we were really paranoid. And anyone who had a weapon was considered a combatant or somebody had maybe a, a wooden crate that had explosives at some point. Uh, not that they found explosives in the case, but that they just had the case. And that was enough to consider some of these people enemy combatants. And we get there, and there, they have like this, this containment area, which is circled with um, concertina wire, which it's like really razor sharp wire, like much worse than barbed wire. And they're, they're barefoot, and they're hooded with sandbags and their hands were tied and basically our job was to yell at them and to, to tell them to get up and get down and to turn around and you know raise their arms and things like that and if that didn't work because they were so tired some of them had been up for 72 hours we would um, grab this huge sledgehammer and then hit the wall next to them and because of the structure of these bunkers the echo is so strong that it sounds like an explosion so when you hit the wall next to the detainee who's deprived from sleep and, and light and sense of space and everything, it scares him to the point that he'll do anything you ask him to do. And then the next stage was to grab a, a pistol and put the pistol to the, prison, the prisoner's head through the sandbag and press it against his head and then charge the weapon to make the, the detainee feel or, or believe that he's about to be executed on the spot. And this is how we kept them sleep deprived for, for two and three days to quote unquote soften them up for interrogation. And this is the first mission that we have. So at this point it's no longer something abstract, you know, the concept of war, the concept of torture, the concept mm -hmm. of, you know, traveling halfway across the world to abuse people. But this is something that's actually tangible, something that we are doing. And as we do it, we become it. We become the abuse, we become the torture. And it affects you in a way that no newspaper article can, can affect you because it's you doing this, it's you witnessing, it's you being a part of this, it's you creating this fear, it's you creating this pain, it's you creating this sadness, it's you bringing this destruction upon this people.